welcome you to this panel. This is um, part of our historical perspectives on America in crisis. This is a series of panels that the history department has been running um, since last spring. This is the fifth since such panel. Um, this one is titled Charlottesville and Beyond, Why Are Historical Monuments Controversial? This panel series came out of the changing political climate over this past year. Many faculty in the history department were um, distressed in many ways, like many other um, students, and many of our students were. The, the political climate had shifted, discussions had shifted, the tenor of politics had shifted, um, and it seems as though much of the political processes, social norms that we had expected were becoming changed, and no one quite knew what to make of it. And several scholars City. Have starting in actually 2013, had had discussions about taking this monument down. Many people felt that a monument to a Confederate general um, was deeply problematic and deeply offensive. There was a lot of push and pull back. The city council, though, in February of 2017, decided to remove the monument. They were immediately faced the next month with a lawsuit from several white nationalist groups who said this is not okay. The argument on behalf of removing the monument was this is offensive to many. This is someone who upheld slavery, fought to preserve slavery, and this really doesn't have a place in the public sphere. Other people opposed to the removal of the monument said, this is erasing a history, and that is not okay. We want to preserve this history. So history and national identity and memory became kind of encapsulated in these conversations. In between this, starting in 2015, several states, including Louisiana and Texas, also began to have discussions about taking down similar monuments, and several of those monuments had come down. So by the time that um, Charlottesville decides in February 2017 that it's going to remove this monument, there had been discussion among many southern states at this point in time. This summer, there were white nationalist rallies in June, white nationalist rallies in July. They didn't get a lot of coverage. The rally that did get coverage was in August, because that time the white supremacists who came um, to Robert E. Lee Park, and the park at that point had been renamed Emancipation Park, were met by counter-protesters. And these were, this was the event in which um, a car was driven into crowds, a woman died, um, two state troopers were killed when the helicopter that they were in, which was patrolling the area, crashed. Dozens and dozens of people were hurt, both by the car that ran into the crowd, and also by the confrontation between protesters. This is when we started to see tiki torches, right? Um, so what the history department wanted to do and what we wanted to think about was what does, what do these monuments mean? What's the process by which a monument goes up? What's the process by which, for example, it's revised? What's the process by which it's removed? In what instance should these things happen? In which instance should they not? So what we're trying to do here today is to bring together this panel of lovely experts, I'm just so impressed with my colleagues here, um, to bring different perspectives. So we have three different um, scholars here today. We have Professor Cal Snyder, who teaches American Indian history in our department. He writes about the history of California Indian communities and their land. His most recently published article in the Journal of Civil War History was on the American West, American Indians, and the Civil War. He's going to start off, uh, us off, and he's going to be followed by our colleague, Ann Lindsay, who's an assistant professor of history, and she's a program coordinator of the Capitol Campus Public History Program. Her research considers issues of public memory, heritage tourism, and interpretation of 17th and 18th century British American colonies. Her manuscript, entitled Redefining Interpretations of America's 18th Century Heritage Sites, is under contract with Rutledge Press. Paula Austin is Assistant Professor of History, and she teaches African American history and civil rights history in our department. Dr. Austin is working on a manuscript that examines the intellectual lives of poor and working class African Americans, and the racially segregated U.S. Capitol in the early 20th century, and is under contract with New York University Press. She has a forthcoming article on new Negro visual representations that will appear in the Journal of African American History. So what we're going to do is give each of our panelists about 10 minutes to come up to present material to help us understand issues of historical memory, monuments, controversy. Um, after that, I'll start us off in a Q&A with a couple questions, and then we'll turn it all over to you. Does that sound good? All right. Thank you, uh, Professor Christian, for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks, Professor Siegel, for uh, bringing us all together. Um, I'm going to pin my remarks to the subtitle uh, of our panel today, 
and attempt to answer that, uh, that, that question, uh, and more specifically, uh, answer that question in reference to these specific monuments. Why are monuments like those that were at stake uh, in Emancipation Park controversial? Um, so first, uh, the subtitle uh, suggests an interesting uh, historical question. Might there actually be something inherently controversial about monuments themselves? Um, actually, yes. Uh, they, they, we, we haven't always taken them for granted in the United States. Um, monumentalizing individuals in particular is not something that this country uh, always thought a democracy should be doing. Uh, at the time of the American Revolution, the, the, the monuments that the revolutionary generation knew best uh, were monuments to, to basically rulers, to hereditary power, uh, to, to hereditary privilege, to, to the king. So one of the iconic uh, acts of uh, the early days of the American Revolution was pulling down the statue of King George III in Bowling Green, uh, on, on Bowling Green in, in, in Manhattan. Um, modeled, uh, the statue, it's only been up for about six years, it was modeled after um, uh, the statue of Marcus Aurelius in, in Rome. So uh, a, an emperor of a lapsed republic, and what better symbol of republican virtue in the early days of the revolution than to pull down uh, this image of a tyrant. Um, also, it's made lead and you can make bullets from it. <laughs> in the early republic, in the early days of the United States as an independent country, um, Americans retain their skepticism with this kind of uh, monument to history on horseback. Uh, they're very skeptical for a number of reasons of monumentalizing, particularly military leaders. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a distrust of a standing army uh, in the United States. Uh, on either side of the political spectrum in the United States, there's, there's suspicion of hereditary power and class privilege. On the other side, there is a suspicion, a suspicion of the so-called mob, and that the mob might elevate a military chieftain uh, to positions of power. So just about everybody uh, looks at monuments to individuals, particularly military individuals, with some skepticism. Uh, George Washington is somewhat singular uh, in the hearts of his countrymen. Uh, but even he doesn't get a statue in the city that's named after him until 1840. And it's kind of a weird one. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not a military posture. Uh, and that's, that's, that's deliberate, right? Um, so John Quincy Adams, uh, another president, writes in the 1830s, I think kind of sadly, I think he's kind of, he's, he's kind of bummed about this, uh, democracy has no monuments. It strikes no medals. It bears the head of no man upon its coin. Its very essence is iconoclastic. Its very essence is tearing down those kind of statues. That changes. Uh, monuments, like everything, has a history. This is going to change in the era of the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War sparks the greatest era uh, in monument construction in the United States, and it's a, it's, a, it's a craze that continues for the rest of the 19th century. And so by the 20th century, everybody just kind of takes for granted that there's going to be giant open statues uh, mostly of soldiers in, in public places. Um, one explanation for why the Civil War triggers this is the massive amount of, of death uh, involved. Uh, three quarters of a million people, maybe 800,000 people die in the Civil War. Uh, it's death on an unprecedented scale. Uh, it is something that Americans have a hard time coming to terms with. Uh, it requires some sort of cultural work to make sense uh, of this mass death or um, maybe to put it to rest. Um, the finality of the monument, uh, the permanence of its concrete expression uh, of sentiment, its setting apart from everyday experience, uh, this, this becomes really important to Americans, memorializing particularly the dead. You see this one from Illinois, uh, the heroic dead of Stevenson County. Uh, so these are the first, the first monuments uh, that pop up after the Civil War uh, is over, kind of the last word on a, on a painful painful moment. Um, there's another reason monuments get cheaper. Uh, they're mass produced. You don't need to hire a, 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 a sculptor to make the monument from the ground up. Uh, you can mass produce it uh, uh, and basically buy it cheap and, and pop up a monument uh, to, to, to lost soldiers. The Civil War makes monument, uh, monument uh, construction more important as a public act. It also changes who the monuments are for. These are Ordinary soldiers, enlisted men in the Union Army, they aren't the generals. Obviously, this is most of the people who are going to die in the Civil War uh, are not generals. Uh, a fair number of generals die, but most of the people who die are not. Um, so it's not about rulers, it's not about military leaders, it's about ordinary citizens of the democracy. Um, so there's a moment where monuments seem to be democratized, 
people, citizens of democracy kind of get used to the idea of building monuments in public space. Uh, but these acts of memorialization are going to set firm boundaries to who is going to be included in the democracy and the people, and it's going to set firm limits to what the war can mean in public space. Most of the monuments put up in the South are put up 30 years after the war is over. They're not meant to represent the same things that the monuments in the North or after the war represent. They're in fact not meant to represent some meaning to the war in a larger sense of transformation, uh, of a just cause. They're meant to strip much of the meaning of, of the war. Uh, they're meant to dismiss questions of ideology from the war and to focus on, very specifically, on the devotion of individual soldiers to their cause, a cause to described as defending their homes, obscuring the actual cause of the war. Slavery and white supremacy are the cause of secession and the cornerstone on which this would-be southern nation was built. So those are the causes of the war. That's what's at stake in the Civil War. In the aftermath of the Confederate defeat in the war, though, ex-Confederates, military officers and politicians, including Jefferson Davis, the ex-president, lead an effort to rehabilitate the cause for which they, they fought. At the same time, really importantly, to stop and reverse the revolution that the war began. And this is the so-called lost cause mythology. Uh, that it was a noble cause, lost for not, not some fault in the cause, but because of overwhelming numbers. So Southerners, after the Civil War, cast themselves as rebels against a tyrannical government, putting themselves in the role of George Washington, continuing the work of the generation of 1776. They cast the South as a new Athens, a true inheritor of Republican principles in the United States that was attacked, that was invaded by the, quote, free, mob, free mobocracy of the North and besieged by a rapacious industrial society. There was a valiant effort to repel the invaders, but impossible odds wear the South down. And in defeat, the South has emancipation forced upon it. In the lost cause mythology, the Southern version of the Civil War that starts to get monumentalized, slavery is nothing worse than Christian apprenticeship for people the white South considers a savage race, something for their benefit. Emancipation, white Southerners say, was the quote, great crime of the century. And so resistance to it and resistance to reconstruction, the enfranchisement of African Americans, was a sacred duty. White Southerners argued that the war wasn't really about the defense of slavery, but at the same time they continued to defend slavery. After the kind of generation of leaders passed, the task of, 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 of carrying on the lost cause tradition passed on to ordinary veterans, uh, their children, their widows, uh, their spouses. They take up the work in the last decade of the 19th century and carry it into the 20th. This is the era in which the White South is constructing Jim Crow, at the same time as building monuments to the lost cause. Organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, uh, United Confederate Veterans, promoted charity uh, on the one hand, but they also promote uh, Southern history, or their version of Southern history. It dwells on the South's virtues and on the valor of Southern soldiers in battle, a way to obscure, again, the causes of the war. Monuments are really important to this work. This is when you get the hundreds of monuments to the Confederacy, Confederate soldiers, and Confederate leaders popping up around the South, not popping up being deliberately built by people in the South, <laughs> not, not sprouting from the ground. Um, Robert E. Lee is especially central to this project. Um, he was the uh, commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, Northern Virginia. Uh, when, it, when that army surrenders, the Civil War is basically over for the South. Um, after the war, he takes on kind of a godlike status in the Lost Cause mythology. Um, statues of Lee go up all over the South, also other Confederate officers in parks, near courthouses, in government buildings, 
when Virginia has to decide what two statutes to send to the U.S. Capitol to represent the state, they send Washington and they send uh, Robert Lee. Uh, he beats out Thomas Jefferson, another president of the United States. Um, so the general, Lee, becomes a national hero, a southern national hero, an immortal hero of unending southern resistance. So people are deliberately building this figure, not just to remember Lee as a nice guy and a great general, but he's going to lead an ongoing resistance in the South. There are a bunch of other statues and memorials put up in the South uh, to ordinary soldiers. There is, there is uh, uh, to enlisted men, uh, that, that, all, that trend is also present in the South. Um, whether it's generals or, 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 or enlisted soldiers, uh, the message is one of white solidarity in the South solidarity and resistance to northern interference and explicitly to black equality. Uh, as the bottom of this one says, so this is the United for Better Veterans Union, like our um, veterans organization for better veterans. Uh, as it says at the bottom, it's dedication to the preservation of Anglo-Saxon civilization. That's what, the, that's what the Confederacy was, they say, and that's what the lost cause would be about. So war monuments are going to announce the end of the Civil War on southern terms. Most planned emancipation monuments in the North don't get built. There are a couple of proposed freedom uh, monuments proposed. They don't get built. They get dropped for lack of support. Uh, the one that does get built, or there's a couple that do get built, tend to put Abraham Lincoln uh, in a prominent position. Uh, one uh, in Washington, D.C. is complete with a kneeling slave, uh, which does not at all uh, uh, signify to most viewers uh, emancipation, freedom. Uh, South Carolina, meanwhile, build a statue commemorating the faithful slaves of the Confederacy. So the experience of the war, as monumentalized, is, for the most part, a military experience, not a societal experience, not something society in general experiences. And the military experience of the war was closely identified with the South's experience, with the Confederate experience. When Richmond unveils uh, that statue in 1890, uh, most northern and western uh, Republican newspapers uh, expressed, expressed some alarm at the number of Confederate battle flags that were flying again in 1890. Uh, but the New York Times, really importantly, claims possession of the monument on behalf of the American people, uh, hinting at the North's gradual embrace of the South through, its, through an idea of shared military heritage and the valor of soldiers on both sides who were fighting for their cause, dropping a really key point that the causes were fundamentally irreconcilable. And this is a point, I should say, that, that Union veterans, white and black, insist upon into the 20th century. There were, there were reasonable differences, there were real differences uh, between the North and the South's cause. But again, the, monumental, the, the monumentalization of the past really makes the Southern experience of war, the military experience of war, the experience not emancipation. So why are these monuments controversial? Um, they're monuments to the construction of white supremacist, white supremacist regimes that were geared to stop the emancipatory promise of the Civil War. That alone does not make them controversial. The controversy, the argument about them, arises because the builders of these monuments wanted them to be the timeless last word on the war, and they aren't. Monuments are statements about the past contained within the era that produced them. They are supposed to be removed from everyday life, locked in the past, but we inhabit history as a lived experience. Even if we don't study it professionally, our view of the past comes from the present. So the controversy comes then because of our different views in the present. It comes because this version of the Civil War is not the only version that Americans have to work with. African Americans maintained a memory of the war, uh, a war that was more than a heroic struggle between white brothers. In later life, uh, dismayed as he was by a new spirit of secession, uh, by the resurrection of doctrines that he thought had been destroyed by the, quote, iron logic of cannonballs. Frederick Douglass, uh, the, the abolitionist and political leader, says, monuments are no, 
The history of slavery and emancipation as the central story of the war couldn't be easily forgotten. On Memorial Day, 1871, at Arlington Cemetery, uh, which was built on uh, what was until the war Robert E. Lee's uh, estate, Douglas tells a crowd, we are sometimes asked in the name of patriotism to forget the merits of this fearful struggle and to remember with equal admiration those who struck at the nation's life and those who struck to save it, those who fought for slavery and those who fought for liberty and justice. I am no minister of malice. I would not repel the repentant, but may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I forget the difference between the parties to that bloody conflict. Elsewhere he writes, well may the nation forget, it may shut its eyes to the past and frown upon any who may not do otherwise, but the colored people of this country are bound to keep the past in lively memory till justice shall be done them. Thank you. What results? 
is an individualized impression of the monument, which may have nothing to do with the intention of those who erected it. This is what allows some groups to claim monuments as representations of an individualized heritage, or to use them for the purposes of propaganda, or to claim them as authentic representations of the past. As a society, we tend to take the messages conveyed in monuments as truth, because their messages are literally written in stone. What we don't always connect with is that a moment represents a piece of historical argument, one perspective in a larger dialogue. Just because you memorialized your point doesn't make it the only perspective, and it doesn't make it the truth. Some memorials are constructed with the intention of allowing us to find our own meaning and to give us space for grief or space for reflection. Others have a more specific message or acquire one over time. Another issue to consider is the meanings, uh, that the meaning of monuments will change over time as society changes. So do the issues that matter to society. Those change too. And the elements of the past that resonate with their current lives also change. So in this way, the meanings of monuments are renegotiated again. They may have the meaning, they may never have the meaning or purpose um, to the community that they had originally again. Um, they might hold a new meaning. They might become a symbol to rally behind, or they may become entirely obsolete. Um, and either of those is far removed from the original intention of the site. So for the last 10 years, I've been exploring the monuments uh, in Salem and Danvers, Massachusetts, related to the witch trials and the witch history that the city of Salem capitalizes on in their tourism. And you can go to Salem and learn about the Daniel Hawthorne or about maritime heritage in the 18th century. If you'd like to see some lovely architectural examples of the 18th and 19th century, I encourage you to go. Um, but for most people who are going to Salem, they're going for witches. Right? They want to understand that witch heritage. And I have five monuments for us to look at here, so you consider how individuals interact with monuments on a basic level, um, and how monuments are used and interpreted. Uh, the first two I have are the monuments that were erected for the 300th anniversary of the witch trials. So the witch trials happened in 1692. Um, so these are constructed in 1992. The one here is in Danvers, Massachusetts, uh, and the one to the right is in Salem, Massachusetts. And these two locations are important because the major events between um, the, the participants of the witch trials were between the Salem, people of Salem Village and the people of Salem Town. Um, one city kept its name as Salem and the other changed it to Danvers to remove themselves from that history. Um, but the majority of the victims of the witch trials were from Danvers, um, and the majority of the accusers were from Salem. Mm -hmm. And so as you look at, if you go to Salem and Danvers today, Salem is the one that draws all the tourists, but all the authentic sites of witchcraft for the most part are in Danvers, and you have to go find them. Um, and so these two monuments are conveying different things. Uh, the one in Danvers is erected across the street from the original port, uh, which is not still there. But the site of the original port where the trials happened before the main port of Boyer and Terminer was uh, convened in Salem. And as you look at this monument, think about walking towards it. So this is in the middle of a park. So facing that other site, uh, you have to park away from it and walk to it. So there's a deliberation. You want to get to this place. Um, and you're being judged. There's a judge at the top who's looking down at you. Um, you're standing in front of a book. And it says, in memory of, and that's the book of life, in memory of the innocents who died during the Salem Village witchcraft hysteria in 1992. There are shackles um, on this table, and on the tablets behind you have not only a list of the victims and how they died, but also some words from those victims uh, taken from the transfer of the trial. So this is allowing you multiple ways to think. It's giving you many avenues of reflection. Think about the shackles, think about the victims, think about their words, and about what it might be to stand in judgment before the judge there at the top. And even the name, which have victims memorial, they want to be very focused on the victims, and that's what they want you to think about. There's no interpretive signage. You're inter interfacing with these symbols on your own. The Salem Witch Trials Memorial is a very different approach. It's meant for reflection. Um, it has trees in the center that uh, are locust trees, which has meaning for the site. Um, and they also have benches, as you can see, coming out of the stone walls. Each bench has the name of one of the witchcraft victims. And here at the bottom, this threshold into the site has um, the pleas of innocence from the victims themselves. These are also taken from court transcripts, how people chose to defend themselves. Um, they're quite disturbing, and they're cut short by this wall, just as their protests were cut short um, by verdicts. 
And if you don't know, if during the witch trials, if you pled innocent, you were likely to be hanged. If you were <coughs> guilty, you were likely to be spared. So this is what those benches look like. Now the people who intended this monument, who dedicated this monument, um, they wanted you to interact with it in the way that they saw it. So while it's open for reflection, they'd also like to guide you and to tell you what you should be thinking. And there's a QR code on here that if you scan it, um, it will take you to a guide for how you might interact with the site. Things to reflect on, things to think about. And one of the reasons they've done that is because um, it's a large grassy area in an otherwise pretty uh, built up area and have become a dog park in the evenings. <laughs> um, and so they really want that sense of reflection to remain. It also has a gate to it from a cemetery beyond, and that's a 17th, 17th century dog park. So they would, or dog park? <laughs> <laughs> They want you to see that graveyard beyond, and that's there on purpose. And they do engage with that cemetery, even though it's not part of the actual monument itself. They want you to see that. They want you to reflect on death um, and some victims here. Um, so, as we move forward, this is a witch, the witch, Salem Witch Hanging Site Memorial, which was dedicated this summer. So this is the newest of the witchcraft memorials. And it's sort of oddly placed because we already have a witchcraft memorial in Salem, so like, what's the purpose of having a second one, right? Um, this memorial is actually constructed on the site where the hangings occurred. This is Proctor's Ledge. Um, there was a team of historians um, and other scientists who went and used ground penetrating radar and, and lots of different research to figure out where it actually happened. They really wanted to know where Gallows Hill was. Before this, the assumption was that the mall had built on, been built on Gallows Hill. Um, but through research, they established that the mall was not where people were killed. And so they they built this monument to the witch house. This is in the middle of a neighborhood. It's a residential area. It's actually tremendously difficult to find. There is no interpretive signage. And if you ask people in Salem about it, they don't know about it. I asked park rangers. I asked police. I asked uh, tour guides. They were like, eh, it's out there. There's no parking. And tour buses are not allowed to come here. So you get the sense that this is maybe a site for more personal reflection. When it was dedicated, um, descendants of the families were there. Um, but you also wonder if this is if this site is here, a second monument, when there's already one for reflection, also for reflection, because um, this is one of the only authentic sites of the witch trials in Salem itself. And many tourists are looking for an authentic experience of the past. And they want to know where things actually happened. And none of the other monuments are where something actually happened on the site. Um, and so, perhaps more popular for tourists, although it's pretty empty mm -hmm. in the middle of the day in the summer. How is it right now, like days before Halloween? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, we also have some statues in Salem with unintended meanings. Um, and so I have two here. This is Roger Conant, um, which was constructed in 1913. Um, and that is Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched. <laughs> um, Elizabeth Montgomery's statue is probably the most popular um, photo op in all of Salem. It's in the middle of the tourist area. And the, the, um, the one with the park with the cemetery, that one's just off the tourist area. It's right there. It's pretty convenient. But if you're a tourist in Salem and you're walking down the main street, Elizabeth Montgomery is smiling at you at the end of the street. And she really represents for many people what Salem is about. Right? A witch, a relatable witch, it's fun, it's enjoyable, and it allows them an escape from the thought of victims and from the thought of the hysteria that happened in this place. So it allows them to have, but it's like gives them permission to have fun in a place where perhaps they should be experiencing grief and reflecting on a deeper level. So they've given this Elizabeth Montgomery statue a meaning that perhaps it didn't have. Um, and the, the meaning that's supposed to be conveyed, there's like the stars at the bottom have some language in them, and they're basically commemorating the fact that like one episode of Bewitched was filmed here. Um, and that there's a witch trials episode of Bewitched in the 70s. Um, and TV Land says that Be Bewitched is what brought Salem into what it is today, but it was actually a Halloween festival in the 1980s. Um, but if you read TripAdvisor, which is my main conduit to what people think of monuments right now, um, people complain that the lines are so long to take pictures with Elizabeth Montgomery in the summertime. They're really angry about it. So they've given this a meaning. No one's complaining about the long lines. Of the <laughs> my other statue with an unintended meaning is, is Roger Conant here. Roger Conant is constructed in 1913 by his family. He's in the middle of an intersection. And when, he, when this monument is built, 
Um, it's not in the middle of the busy intersection, I mean, it's in the middle of town, but it's facing Salem Common because he's the founder of the town. Um, and so they wanted to commemorate that. But on some travel blogs, they say that he is a witch. And other travel blogs say Roger Conant is one of the judges of the witch trials, which has nothing to do with, I mean, Roger Conant was dead before it ever happened. But people are giving the statue this meaning, and it's now, later on, I told you that location matters, the town has changed around him. Salem Common is still there, but the, the town has built up around him, and next door, he's next door to the Salem Witch Museum. So people on their way to the Witch Museum are like, look, there's a monument to a witch on the way to, or look, there's a witch judge on the way to the Witch Museum. And many pictures of the Witch Museum have him in the foreground. People take pictures of the Witch Museum with Roger, with Conant in front, and he has nothing to do with it. So people have given him a meaning that he never had. So if you Google Witch Monument, he's there. <laughs> um, and so we have to think, as we look at monuments, about the way that the meanings change over time, and the way that individuals give them meanings that they perhaps wouldn't have otherwise, and sort of be suspect um, about you know, the heritage that's being represented or not represented um, by those things. Um, and uh, 
What about, oh, wait, actually, before we talk about Columbus, and that's who, so that's a statue of Columbus that's in uh, Central Park that, as you can see, has been commented upon. But let's go, we're going we're gonna to come back to that. Let's go here. What about this dude, right? We love him. He's like one of our favorites. Um, Abraham Lincoln, right? We credit him with freeing the slaves, but we, we have other information about him, right? He served in the Black Hawk War in Illinois. I mean, he didn't see any action, but he did serve in the war. Um, but he's responsible for one of the largest mass hangings in U.S. history in 1862, right? 38 uh, Dakota men in Minnesota. Um, so, and by the way, those 38 men, uh, their bodies were dug up after they were buried and uh, experimented on by the man who would then start what we know today as the Mayo Clinic. And actually, the Mayo Clinic had to return those remains, whatever was left of those remains in the 1990s, um, because of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Um, and maybe we'll talk more, maybe we'll get to talk about Sims a little bit. Um, so we'll come back to this today. Um, all right, but let's let's talk about let's go back to Columbus. We also like him, right? I mean, he's a mainstay. So both of his, both his uh, statue in Columbus Circle in New York and this one in the park uh, have received some comments recently, as you can see, right? Red painted hands to represent blood. Now, Columbus, of course, we talk about his discoveries, right? Land upon the stands, one of those um, uh, Well, maybe not this section. But, um, <laughs> you know, Sam in the Ocean Blue, 1492, where we have all of that. And actually, if anybody saw Blackish's, uh, the ABC show, just did uh, an episode about our friend and about uh, slavery. Um, but, you know, Columbus could actually be credited with essentially, I mean, if we're going to credit him for something, with sort of beginning the transatlantic slave trade, right? So he captures and sends to Spain some two dozen uh, Tainos who are the indigenous folks of uh, what, we, what we know of today as Haiti and the Dominican Republic. He writes a letter going with them that calls them cannibals, wild and well-built, finer than any other slaves once they are freed from their humanity, which they will lose as soon as they leave their own lands. Well, at least he said they had some lands. Um, so we have his raids, we have his capture of over 3,000 more Tainos the year after. Um, so we've got evidence of terrorism, of exploitation, right, of violence, sort of peppered with this language of, of benevolence. So I think my uh, main point to sort of take us home um, takes us back to this a little bit. So by not interrogating, right, all of our figures, not just the Confederates, but sort of all of the figures uh, in our history, we end up normalizing things that we probably shouldn't be normalizing. Indigenous genocide, colonialism, um, slavery, right? Instead of actually reckoning with our real history. So if, if we're only going to use the Holocaust as the only legible genocide, right? Or if we're only going to use European fascism as the only legible mo model of authoritarianism, then essentially we're going to kind of entrench ourselves in a particular sort of redemptive vision of US history, right? And maybe that's what we want to do. Maybe that's my design. But maybe it isn't. So um, I want to take us back to our friend Lincoln. Um, so this is you know, maybe one of the least controversial monuments, right? I mean. We love this guy, and maybe we think about this particular memorial as the one that King stood in front in 1963 when he had his eye, when he made his eye speak. Maybe this is how we think about this. But this uh, memorial was dedicated in 1922, so in the time that Professor Schneider talked about this kind of resurgent, uh, kind of white supremacist uh, um, uh, model. Uh, to kind of try to reclaim and rename uh, the history of the Civil War and what the world was fought over. So 1922, two years before that, Robert E. Lee monument goes up. Um, and at the dedication, Washington, D.C. has been uh, sort of officially uh, racially segregated, right? So 
many new laws put in place in the city. And the segregation is manifest in terms of who's able to sit closest to the monument. So African Americans who would have been considered sort of elites at that time, who are asked to come and speak at the dedication, have to like trudge through the mud from their like black seating a block away from the memorial to like get up to the stage to make a speech to dedicate the memorial. And Robert R. Moten, who is the successor to Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute, is actually asked to not talk, don't talk about Jim Crow, don't talk about lynching, like we're, that's not what this is about. And so he gets his speech sort of revised for him in order to, to, make, the, um, to, to make the dedication. And if you look at the text that's engraved above the um, shrine above it, it says, above our friend Lincoln, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. So, I mean, I think as both of my colleagues have said, the emphasis there on union, right, over emancipation, which I think leaves us with the question of, well, who did Lincoln save the union for? So, I'm stuck. Thank you, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with the audience, is throw out a couple questions just to get us started, and then I can turn it over to you because I would imagine you have some questions for my colleagues. Does that sound good? All right. Um, so let me throw this out there. Why is commemorating events and individuals in public space? such an important process of creating, preserving, and revising national identity? Why is this part of who we are? Why does it have to get mapped on certain spaces? And I would argue at different times. You kind of touched on it, but I wonder if you can put it in that framework of identity. Because it seems like that's a lot of what's going on now with Charlottesville, what I did say at the beginning, um, was much of the brouhaha over it came from the way that the president spoke about it. Um, at first, he kind of condemned both sides, and then he said, no, it's just white supremacists, and then he doubled down on his first comment, and everyone just said, what is going on here? And then he had a comment um, that Dr. Austin said about what's next, and it became this aligned himself with a particular group, and that, in many ways, was what um, this notion of our national identity is at stake because of monuments coming down or because of monuments being revised. Why is that so important to America? I'll start. Um. I think because uh, they're authoritative, as I said, they, they, they claim to be the last word. Uh, they become uh, part of the landscape and they appear somewhat natural. Uh, that's kind of one of the best ways you can exercise power is in your room it's eventually occurring. Um, what happens is you'll have a society which there are many different memories, many different viewpoints. Uh, not all of those viewpoints get to be represented on the landscape. Um, I had a slide about it in Kentucky. Kentucky had a Robert Lee statue, has a Robert Lee statue. Kentucky was not in the Confederacy. <laughs> um, Kentucky put up a bunch of monuments to, uh, to Confederates, basically because pro-Confederate Southerners won. Uh, they, they suppressed Unionist Kentuckians, African-American Kentuckians, uh, and that became their contribution to the construction of white Southern national identity. Uh, so I think one of the things, this is not all the money, to talk about this is, uh, it's the voice of authority. This is the official memory of the nation. I think they have a large role in identity in that, especially when we're talking about some of the Civil War monuments, it's not, not only power, but about explaining to individuals where they fit within a social order in monuments. Um, and I think my example would be there's a series of, in the newspapers you can buy Confederate water, water fountains. The Confederate water fountains are very popular. Um, in the period that Dr. Schneider was talking about where we're renegotiating this past and what it means. Those water fountains are purchased by Daughters of Confederate Veterans and others and put in the centers of cities, but they are segregated water fountains in the monument. So this is set in stone. And in many of the ones that you can purchase, there was a Confederate soldier looking down um, at the water fountain so that people knew their place, um, so that they understood that segregation. And so it was very much trying to and reinforce Jim Crow ideas and the segregation of the South from the monument. Um, and even though it didn't say in stone, um, this is where you fit, the fact that they had labeled in stone the water fountains does tell you this is where you fit in the society that you've constructed. Uh, yeah. Why do you think, if, if the 
process of creating, um, revising, and removing monuments is um, clearly an ongoing one. Why do you think these issues come up at certain times? Like, why is it that Charlottesville, this past summer, it came to to such violence? Why did it take on national meeting? Why, at different points in time, have we have monuments? Has the production of reconstruction of monuments, or this question of removal, and that's been a big issue. Do you remove a monument? If you do, where does it go? Who will see it? Is it important that people still see it? If you revise the monument, what does that mean, right? Um, who will recognize this? For whom does it mean? What's that, and then, you know, as the man was saying, what's that process by which a man's monument gets revised or taken down? There's this whole bureaucracy behind it. Um, so, if, you know, we've talked about certain particular moments. Um, why is it that certain moments come onto monuments? Is it, does that make sense? Is that a nice one? Worded, carefully worded question. But why is it maybe this particular moment? Can you take that one? Why are the Confederate monuments starting in 2015 starting to come down? Why did they become so explosive this past summer? What is it about the current political or social? I think the, the murders in Charleston have a lot to do with the questioning from public displays that Jim Crow by nationalism, um, battle flag, uh, uh, which led to a lot of other questioning. Grant, but certainly not, uh, uh, these things have been noticed on the landscape before. This is not the beginning of people being around. Hey, there's like monuments out um, But it's a moment where people, where, where the other, where other monuments have a lot of things exist. I see hands like popping up. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, have, I have um, one question or at least an observation. David Dr. Winston, which you said, and I'm particularly struck by the meanings of violence are really determined by the audience. Mm -hmm. And so, when, when you, the uh, example you wanted just a minute ago about the little fountain, you know, that, that's a, uh, to me, anybody would see that as a depression, degrading kind of. Any audience would see that. But somebody like um, maybe Dr. Austin, when you started putting up a number of pictures there, somebody like Columbus, where um, by and large the, the, um, the audience is going to see him as a hero until a, um, a, a vocal minority starts to put out a, their point of view, which then stirs everybody up and now causing, you know, causes maybe some legislation to do that. Whatever. But, but by and large, an audience sees this, this statue, or a lot of them, have something they don't even know about Columbus as being an oppressor of the English people of West Indies. So my question is, if you, if you make the question, if you assumption you can find controversy in almost anything, how far do you think legislation is going to take this in our country to now start to uh, overreact? where the audience doesn't see a guy like Columbus, Columbus as a present person, but there's a whole minority out there. Do you think this is going to be now start to really overwhelm the country? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. You know what it's, it's, okay, it's, so it's, I'll, it's, I'll say this. So monuments change their meaning and societies change. And so while you may see a vocal minority now, isn't that just the vanguard of a change in society and their values? So that as, you know, as more and more people say, you know what, Columbus is an oppressor, you know, we really should, like, so, so you're seeing it as a vocal minority now, but it's really just the tip of a larger iceberg. Um, and then as an older generation that has a problem with Columbus starts to fade away, that newer generation that agrees that this isn't an appropriate monument is going to say, this doesn't stand for us, it doesn't stand for our society, it doesn't stand for our community, it's the element it needs to go. Um, because what are we, if it doesn't stand for us and it doesn't re reinforce our identity, doesn't represent who we are as a community any longer, then it either needs to be reimagined or removed. Uh, and removed is usually the answer. I would add that it's, a, it's usually a vocal minority that puts them up in the first place. Right. <laughs> um, and then they become natural. Um, what, I don't know what that's I'm guessing in the early 20th century. 
Well, it wasn't in 1493. I do agree that uh, these are uh, negative markers uh, that symbolize you know, uh, discrimination, racism, and white uh, supremacy should be uh, taken down. But my question is, when will the social, uh, to, to address to you, Dr. Uh, Austin, how, do, uh, how can us Americans, most importantly, change the construct of oppression that's still reared in its particular and ugly head since uh, uh, John Winthrop's Sermon upon a Hill in 1629 and then all the way to Jefferson, as you have mentioned, as far as I did a lot of research on the notes of Virginia, he, he said that African Americans were biologically inferior, called them orangutans. orangutans. So, uh, how, what can we do to change this so I can walk out of here to feel that I'm a part of this country that I was born in? Thank you. That's a good question. Thank you. I'm not sure I have the answer to that question. I mean, I can only speak for what I feel like it's been my duty to do, which is to help to provide uh, a re-understanding of some of the things that we've been taught historically about these figures in our history. I mean, I think the only way we can fully sort of grapple with our contemporary moment is if we have a real understanding about our history. And we, most of the time, we spend a lot of time uh, sort of not ever knowing the full complexity right, of our history. And it's, I mean, we have, we each individually have complex lives, right, as humans. Um, so it seems odd to me that, like, we can't grapple with the complex history. It's very, it does not, it's counterintuitive to me. Um, it seems like it should be super easy because we live complex lives every single day, so we should actually be able to manage understanding the complex history. And yet, uh, we cannot. So I think my, I, my sense is, like, my, what I feel like is the thing I can do is to continue to produce and then also to share the ones that are being produced those complex histories about that that we yet don't fully you know we don't fully have all of the information right that that's the piece that's evolving that changes culturally that then might have an impact right on the shift about how we might think about some of these things that that we kind of walk past every day and John I think about I mean I think I bet Sims one that we haven't shown yet mm -hmm. is one that when I was living in, and I lived in New York for most of my life that I walked past and I like never once thought a thing about. Dr. Lindsay, because it's about uh, public history and how monuments fit in that. 
What's your um, professional opinion on monuments that people agree are offensive that we should not be celebrating? Do you think that they should be removed or reinterpreted or something else? I think there's two ways to go, and I think we've seen that um, with Charlottesville. Um, I think there's some communities that have said this just needs to go, um, and, and some communities that just decided things need to go, and you know, we've those the famous images of people kind of climbing up and ripping down and, and crumpling statues that were clearly not as durable as they thought. Um, but I, I look at, there are other cities who said, okay, well, if this is history and you want to claim that it's history, then we're going to move it into a historical space, um, which could be a museum. Um, and it could be um, a cemetery, because if you want to memorialize, then memorials belong in cemeteries. But if you, I think once you take it out of that context, because location is so important, right, to, to historic preservation and to any part of public history, once you remove that from its original site, its original context, you've taken some of the meaning out of it, but you've also taken the door to reinterpretation. Um, and so, for me, I, if there's, if there's something that's become polarizing, it's become such a, um, a problem in a community that is causing division, let's say this Rodney Lee monument, I have no problem with destruction of a monument like that any more than I do a, a destruction of a historic house at a site of tragedy, let's say, right? Um, because those are things that don't necessarily need to stay on the landscape. We don't need that reminder. Um, but taking a monument that people are concerned about losing that history and putting it in a space where it can be reinterpreted and where it can start a conversation, I don't necessarily think that that's appropriate. I, you know, and I, I know that uh, in the wake of Charlottesville, the city of Orlando took their Confederate monument out of Lake Hill Park, which is downtown, and moved it into their cemetery with their Confederate veterans and said, all right, if you want to memorialize the Confederacy, this is the space where you can have that conversation, and there, it's here among the Confederate dead, and that seems like a more appropriate place to have it. But there's also, I mean, and this is maybe a little off your topic, but we cannot stop individuals from putting things up on private land. Um, and so as we saw, you, you were saying, hopefully no other monuments get put up, but we know in the wake of Charlottesville, a number have. Um, but they've largely been on private land, or cemeteries that are maintained by the organizations that um, uh, that support these monuments. So it, it's a constant renegotiation. But I would say, you know, I, you don't have to go straight to construction, but it's some case construction. And I, I would add that I think that sometimes we get confused between remembering and reverence. Right? Those are two completely different things and so I think we the, the concerns about the erasure of history, right? I mean that's about memory, the construction of memory, etc. Right? The construction of history. Reference is a different thing. And I think right we could look at some of these as being about reverence, right? And that seems to me what people are concerned about in taking them down. That what they're concerned about is we will no longer revere. And they're not wrong about that. Like we probably should not in many of these cases be revering. That doesn't shift remembering, right? Understanding, right? Those things. So it seems to me like those people get conflated and confused. Uh, do you think that part of what uh, brings up this uh, conversation is that there's not enough creativity, there's not enough uh, things going up, maybe that uh, we have to debate about, like a small group putting up a lot of controversial historical statues versus maybe more just in the public putting out things that are more inclusive and creative and artistic? I think there's lots of monuments being built that are creative, inclusive, and artistic. We're just not finding them in the media in the way that the controversial ones are. But if you look at even more modern uh, memorials to the Holocaust, to 9-11, to, to sites of, of mass tragedy, some of the um, artistic pieces that go up that are meant to be inclusive and to inspire reflection and yet to think about a larger conversation, I think that those are very meaningful and moving and that those are recent. Um, I just think that the ones that we hear about the most are you know, the ones that uh, create polarization. And that's, that's a function of, of media desire because polarization is really interesting. Yeah. The Equal Justice Insti uh, Initiative is working on uh, 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 both a museum and then uh, sort of, uh, sites of, of a memorialization of um, lynching victims across the South primarily. And they've been working on that for a number of years. They have a really interactive uh, website where you can sort of see where people died, who learned who the people were, and they're working on making sure that there are, um, um, that there's a, a museum in Montgomery, Alabama, and then uh, uh, sort of placards at the site, at sites around. That stuff is happening. 
My, um, there's a website called Without Sanctuary. Yeah. That's yeah. powerful. Yeah. Um, my concern is, I think I, I probably echo everything in this room. How do we explain this to a five-year-old, a nine-year-old, a thirteen-year-old? That our country, when we are near to by birth or birth or immigration or whatever, <clears throat> how do we explain? Columbus isn't what I was taught as a child. Lincoln isn't what I was taught as a child, having gone to a school. Lincoln Elementary, Central L. So if I had known as a five-year-old, I would have really had a lot of questions. As a nine-year-old, I would have had even more questions. As a 13-year-old, I would have seen why I lived on this side of the tracks and others lived on that side of the tracks with different geographical benefits or disparities. How do you explain this to young people in their personal lives? I mean, and how do we go about having that discussion that um, we save the union for some? But in reality, it, it's all of our history. And beyond the question of you know, keeping the monuments up, taking them down, I think about children. How do we explain this to our youth? How do we explain that we were built on the backs of slavery and exploitation? And we've done a lot of wonderful things. You know, white America has done a lot of wonderful things, and some parts of white America have done a lot of terrible things. And the question I have is when you in the classroom who are white and American, white U.S. residents, is how do you explain the differences you see on campus or the places you live and the images you see on media? Well, I'll jump in as a parent of a poor seven year old and a historian. Um, and as someone who's thought quite a bit about this in recent years, and as someone who's been working in the history project at UC Davis, we have new social studies standards. Um, so I know Cal has done a series of these two in training teachers. The new social studies standards are far more inclusive. I gave a, um, a series of lectures this past summer on LGBT history. Um, because, and for fourth and fifth grade teachers, because they needed to include that now, they're required. Um, so I have not had a conversation much with one with my four-year-old. Um, but for a seven-year-old, since he was five, we've been having these conversations. And they have come out exactly as you said them. Some things about this country are really wonderful. Some things are really horrific. And, and I said to him what I oftentimes say to my students when I teach 17B, how do you reconcile ideas about freedom, democracy, liberty, in a country founded on slavery, right? And a country that still doesn't recognize that legacy. Um, I've had this very, I mean, full conversations, and I struggle to the extent to which I recognize his white privilege. Um, I don't want him to see himself as different from some of his friends and like some others, but I also probably smack him down a little more than he understands um, for those moments that he says something that triggers me, and I go, oh, no, no, no. You're not going to be that kind of white boy. You know, no. Um, but I've had this really honest conversation with him understood slavery. We did it with a map. I mean, it literally it was an organic conversation. He said at the kitchen table, you know, you have those like plastic placemats with um, the world. And he wasn't reading very well. And he said Jap for Jap Japan. And it was kind of, and I said, you know, you really can't say that. And he said, well, what are you talking about? I don't see the rest of the word. And I explained that we had gone to war with Japan. And that was a racial slur. And it was used to dehumanize. And, and then he looked at me and he said, and I swear, I had not had coffee yet. So it was not my best moment. It was very early in the morning. And he said, well, mommy, where else have you gone to war? And we looked around, and I brought him back to the, to the United States. And I explained the Civil War. And I was very clear that this was about slavery. And he looked, on the one hand, very aghast, but also like, hmm, OK. I mean, it, in, in some ways, it was just that one. And we added on to it. We talked about sexism. Um, and his response to sexism was incredibly adorable, I have to say, because I said something about um, how Hillary Clinton was getting the nomination. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm putting you to bed early. I'm going to watch this one live. This is historic. I'm a women's historian. And he said, well, why is that a big deal? And I said, well, because you know, women and men were expected to be different. And, and women were seen because they could bear children as, as less than men. And he looks up at me and he goes, well, you and dad are exactly the same. Well, close, but yes. <laughs> and then he said, and this is the really sweet part, because then he sat up and he said, well, those people are all in history. Right? Those people who think women are not as equal to men, like those are all back what you study. And I said, no, honey, unfortunately they're still here. And he said, I want the names. <laughs> you know, 
at that point, I, I couldn't give it on. I will not tell you who he named after. Um, and all of a sudden, I knew he was paying attention to the election. Um, but I did not, and I didn't go there with him because it was not appropriate at that time. He was six years old. But I, my answer as a parent, as someone who thinks very hard about this, because I am in the classroom a lot, and I feel a, a lot of my colleagues, but part of my responsibility to these discussions is providing a very complex history. Just tell it like it is, right? At, at an age appropriate level. But I think young people, and I don't know if you guys can answer for yourselves, young, young people, elementary school kids, they can think in complex ways. They're complex people. Their friends are complex people. Their teachers, people in their world. If you keep adding on to it, it just seems kind of like what it is. Now that's you know, just my personal experience. But, but I will say those conversations, and I'm really pleased we're informed by one of my women's history classes. Um, because we had had long conversations in this class, and it was just this magical class about how do you understand your racial identity. And we talked a lot about, this was very clear as we were sharing stories, that the students of color had moments when they understood. And a lot of white students didn't have those moments. So the question became, how do you give that moment, right? How do you make sure everybody has that moment? And it doesn't just become an act of discrimination or an experience of it. Everybody has that moment, right? So it's a I serve on the uh, Staff Advisory Council for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UC Davis Health. And I've been led with the family of 15 migrant farm workers from the Central Valley. I come to this country. Uh, I love this country. Um, I love it because it's my place of birth and because of all the ones that have supported me. But there are conversations about opening this space to say there is a white America. And that's something uncomfortable, but it's something that we're contemplating through our dialogue and the inclusion series, having a conversation sometime next year. Everyone's invited on the whites in America. And I put it out there knowing that that's going to really piss some people off. But the fact of the matter is that we can talk about Latinos in America, we can talk about blacks in America, we need to normalize the conversation to say there is such a thing as something that comes with being white in America. You can be white and low income, you can be black and low income. Hard either way. But there are some things that are important to people, not by virtue that they earned it for any other reason, they're just born in society. It wasn't their fault that they got privilege in the white It's not their fault. It's not a black person's fault that they got lack of privilege for being born in society with privilege in the white person's fault. Because it happens across the world. So I would say there's a responsibility, and I won't go all what people in but I'll speak for me as a white person. And I feel that responsibility to say that privilege is not okay. That I have a responsibility to raise children who are allies. That I have a responsibility not to take that privilege for granted, but also not to hold on to that privilege, and not to use that privilege to put anybody else down, but to extend that privilege to everybody. But that's a conversation that I think is hard. It's a conversation that I've in the classroom heard from white students say you're making me very uncomfortable with saying this. Okay. But we have to talk about it, and I think you're right, we have those conversations do need to be spoken. Um, and they do need to be had, and that's part of a lot of this discomfort is a lot of people saying, I don't know, I, this, you know, I worked for everything, right? And I'm sure you did, but um, like in my class, when we talk about immigration, I, I, have, well, I have witchcraft <laughs> people on one side, and I have Jewish immigrants on the other, who came from um, quite a bit of oppression, but within one generation, they looked white. They were accepted as white. That doesn't happen for everybody. That's a privilege, right? We need to, we need to call that out, whether it's in history and other spots. So I agree with you. Uh, I see a big part of this issue being the differences in education among the regions. Like uh, the lost cause is still taught in the South pretty heavily. They're, they're like removing like uh, references to slavery and changing it to like imported workers and stuff like that. Um, and so I see that their defense of these statutes comes from that a lot of the time. So do you think that maybe like a solution to this is like a monolithic national like history? Or like, I'm just wondering how we fix that. Because they do need that.
and the, in my own work, I sort of think about the, the stories we tell and the, the narratives we teach at historic sites. Um, and they, they establish like a baseline history, and then there's these other histories, right? Um, when really there are all these separate histories, there's just one. The challenge is how do we tell that one in a way that is balanced, in a way that's inclusive, in a way that, that helps us to think in the challenging ways that we need to. I know the books that you're talking about, but those are in certain school districts. It isn't to suggest that there's a, I'm not sure that there's a flaw in the education system. I remember also that, so it's a significant part of education, as we've been discussing here, that happens in the home. It has nothing to do with textbooks. You could change the entire national curriculum and do a civil rights supremacy. Um, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure that education is really the issue. Although I think one of the things that's, that's underlined here is power, right? The power to tell particular stories in particular places at particular times. And I do think that, that I mean, right, we, we've all talked about the power to put up any number of monuments, right? A kind of political economy that allows for some people to have that power and other folks to, to be maybe in those communities where they're using those books and saying, like, what the hell is this, right? So I think that there's, we, we ha I think that's maybe a place for us to, to start trying to figure out the fix, right? I mean, I, I sort of looking at the function of power and who holds that and why they hold that and to make any of these small, what seemingly might be small decisions sort of in different places at different times. I don't know, that's not helpful. That's neither here nor there, but. Mm -hmm. I think the issue of power is right on. I think there is a great threat of the idea that these models of managing can't fire and stuff and stuff. My opinion is there was a significant amount of people driving with Confederate flags on their trucks for all of my life. And then in the last two years, they've been replaced with blue lions, but their behavior and their views have not changed. I'm curious if you think this might happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you said it like your place. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm going to connect uh, a bit back with the issue of monuments and say that the, um, the issue of Charlottesville is just a trend within the idea of deconstructing um, Southern myths. And one of these post-racial uh, post myths that we have is the Confederate flag within, let's say, state flags in the South. And the idea that people could go to state capitals and then take down that flag and it be a symbol of removing, um, a symbol of oppression within the state um, let's say, significant property that say that that's capital. So if we're seeing the Charlottesville as something that is removed from the narrative of post-racial America having elected a black, you know, black president and him being somehow uh, changing everything, but then there's also resistance to, let's say, take out a flag from a, a, a portion of the flag that could be placed something else in that same portion but to refuse to pick out that portion and say, we are reflecting our history as we took it from our state forefathers, the Jefferson, the whoever. And once we come across the South and say, if we're gonna start taking down the monuments like Robert E. Lee, are we then gonna go to the flag, which was another question raised. Are we gonna go to uh, libraries? Are we gonna go to, like Trump was probably the listing, are we going further and further to remove the myths of nation building and statehood and how do we deal with that in the post-racial society? There are people who have anxieties about, well, what if we take out the main dialogue? Are we then are we then lost in the national trajectory of who we are? We've heard some of those voices. And I'm wondering, can we then unravel um, one string and not take out the whole path? Also, why can't we take out the whole fabric? I mean, we can handle it. People, can't we handle it? I think we can handle it. I mean, as a recent immigrant, people, from what I hear, they can't handle it. <laughs> I mean, my grandfather talks for things. For me, it's easy because I'm like, shoot, I can jump here, you know, 12 years ago. Why not? But for people who are invested and say that I'm this many generations and my father.
father and father for this cause and this and that. How do we get them to understand that America will be great, what well, great, it's great, and people are coming into it and they still think it's great. So what's the attachment for older immigrants versus new immigrants? <laughs> I think in many ways you're at this point, if you go back to the question of, that I asked earlier, which is why at this particular moment are we having these huge debates and conflicts over these symbols? Because this is a moment, I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure how I will teach this in 20 years, um, but I'm really sure that this is a pivotal moment in American history. And I think that's for many of us, it's disconcerting. It's really we're used to, we teach American history, we know it very, very well, but we haven't seen anything like this. But we also know what huge transitions mean, and I think this is one of those questions where for a long time there was an image, if not a reality for many, um, that, that we were in a post-racial society, right? That we were, we had figured out this question content. Um, and this recent election torched that, right? So this is in many ways, I, I read these conversations as fights over the identity of this country. What is this country about? Who is it for, right? And these are debates that we've seen in American history over and over and over again in very different ways. Context matter, times matters. I'm not saying history repeats itself. I don't like that idea. But we have had these ongoing debates for a very long time in our country. This, in many ways, is the newest one, but it is explosive. Right? And I think that's why people hold on to those symbols. They hold on to that identity. Be American means different things to different people. And but I think it's been explosive at lots of different times. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, I, have, I also had that Douglas quote that you, that you used. I mean, Douglas is pissed off <laughs> in the late 19th, early uh, 20th century about all of the ways that the Civil War is being sort of reimagined and, and sort of espoused. Um, and so I think there have been these moments where there has been huge debate about identity and image. Um, and so this, so it's not new in that way. There have always been people who have said that that image is not our experience. It's not the most of our experiences. Those images are not true for what the, the lives that people are living. Right? I mean, in Washington, D.C., the capital, the racially segregated capital, Lincoln's memorial is being dedicated. So I think that, that, yes, I think people are experiencing this moment as particularly difficult, right? And maybe cannot handle it. But I think those folks who have not been able to handle it have existed, like in this country for a long time. And I think, and, and some, you know, maybe some of them survived those debates, maybe some of them didn't, but I think, I don't think that's new. I don't think, and I don't think the debate about image is new. Why I wanted to start where I did, we've done it before. I think we look back at the toppling of the statue of King George III, I think it's kind of quaint, uh, but that was the world, that was the framework that English speaking colonists had and they were ready to, to, to tear it down. Uh, I think democratic iconomism is used to do one more, and then we're at the time limit. So as soon as we're done with this one very quick question, yeah. or does everyone need to go? Do. Let's do this. Let's say thank you now. If you have more to, to look at, because I know people have things to do from past the 1.30. Thank you so much for coming. We are